Good evening. Welcome to uh, Cafe Culture, which is um, a consortium based in the northeast of England. It's run since about 2006. And this, as with a lot of things, is the first time that we've gone digital. We run events on philosophy, culture and arts, politics and science. And tonight is one of our politics events run in collaboration with The Philosopher, which is a Newcastle based public philosophy journal. So we're delighted to welcome Carissa Veliz and Alexis Papazoglu to talk on data privacy. And um, it will be in support of Carissa's new book called Privacy is Power, which has been published in the last couple of weeks by Penguin. So I'll ask Carissa and Alexis, if they want to bring themselves up onto the screen, and if not, I'll try. Oh, there we go. Very, very good. So um, I'll just get Carissa up as well. Great, so everyone's here. So I'll introduce Alexis and then hand over to Alexis to introduce so the format of the evening will be they'll be in conversation for about 30, maybe 35 minutes, following which um, we will turn to audience questions. So if you could ask your questions to the by the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens, that would be fantastic. So Alexis is a philosopher and um, he is a freelance writer, um, writes for journals like the New Republic, The Atlantic, and in fact is about to submit a review to the journal I edit The Philosopher, so I'm very excited about that. Um, he's just finished writing and in fact is about to have published his first book. It will be in Greek because he is Greek, and the title which he just told me is Five Alternative Lessons in Philosophy, The Ideas Behind the News. So I'm hopeful that we will see an English version of it within the next year or so. Um, so yeah, I will hand over to Alexis to introduce Carissa, Carissa's book, and then um, they will be in conversation. So I really hope you enjoy the event and I will hand it over now. Thank you very much, Anthony, uh, for that and for organizing the event and for inviting us to uh, discuss this very interesting topic. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, in my part, Carissa Valise, who is uh, the author of this new book, Privacy is Power, which has just been published. Um, uh, Carissa is a, an associate um, professor in the Faculty of Philosophy and the Institute for Ethics and AI at the University of Oxford. And um, alongside her, her scholarly work, she is also uh, uh, publishes a lot of her work in um, newspapers and journals like the uh, New York Times, The Guardian, The New Statesman, so she's a very uh, familiar with with public philosophy as well as as academic philosophy and her book is is very much a testament to that. It's a book that doesn't read at all like a kind of dry academic book, it's more like a manifesto. It's written in this kind of very powerful way uh, which I really enjoyed, it's very readable. Um, and it's very topical as well. Um, you know, the 2020 elections, uh, presidential elections in the US are coming up. We recently uh, found out from um, some reporting from, from uh, Channel 4 News that, um, you know, the Republican Party was trying to suppress uh, the vote of uh, the black communities in various states through using their data. Um, and this informed their digital campaign, which we might come to discuss a bit later. Um, so let me start uh, with a, a pretty sort of simple question. I've been someone who follows these, uh, the reporting around privacy and, and journalism and places like the New York Times, and I still find it shocking reading your book about how much stuff um, these private companies know about us. And I was wondering whether you have a particular sort of data point that you think is particularly um, shocking that, you know, um, places like Facebook, Google know about us. Thank you, Alexis. Uh, it's really nice to, to be here. You know, the interesting thing is that I find it shocking, even like rereading what I already wrote. So supposedly I know these things. And yet when I read them again, it's just incredible. 
And one, one of the things that that shows is how abstract data is. So when I say like all your data is being collected, Alexis, you might say, okay, yeah, that's true. And I understand like how Facebook tracks me vaguely, but that's really abstract. We don't really get to feel it in our own bodies. And so in the first chapter, I follow a person's day just to illustrate exactly the kind of data and the kind of thing that can be inferred. So it includes things like uh, what you buy online, how well you eat or not, whether you sleep well or not, whether you know you wake up in, in, in the middle of the night and search something online, at what time do you wake up, at what time do you go to bed, who do you sleep next to, um, how much you, you weigh, what are your political tendencies, what are you scared of, what keeps you up at night, and what are your what is your sexual orientation, your credit history, um, your educational records. It really covers so much. And maybe something that, that really alarmed me is how easy it is to track just anyone. So in the US, if you want to um, track the exact location of somebody and you know their phone number, it costs about twelve fifty to do so. And I think that should scare us. Yeah. That is really scary. And I really like that sort of first chapter of dramatization that you that you introduce the, the, the reader into this topic through following someone's day. And it, it is shocking to see how many points, any move that we make, any kind of contact that we make with a with a person through our phone or even sometimes just by being in a room with a, a smart uh, device means that a lot of our actions are, are being recorded. Um, I want to get this kind of easy rebuttal, the usual rebuttal out of the way quickly, which is, well, what do you have to hide? You know, if you're not up to any criminal business, this data is anonymized, you know, this might be something we tell ourselves, but it's also something that these companies tell us to appease us about any worries that we might have about privacy. So what is, what is your reply to that? My reply is that you do have a lot to hide and you do have a lot of fear and you may not know that. But one thing that may be a symptom of that is, you know, if I ask you to just send me by email your username for your email account and your password, uh, you probably won't do it. And you don't go around telling people certain things. You don't go around giving strangers the key to your house. Why? Because these things can be abused. So for instance, um, you might have a disease that you don't know about and that will be sold, that data will be sold to other institutions who might abuse it. So for instance, it might be sold to an insurance company who might know more about your own health than you do and might decide to um, give you a very high premium. Or if it's like a life insurance, they might even deny you insurance. It might be abused by a prospective employer. Suppose you're an employer and you have two candidates and both candidates are equally well uh, prepared and equally competent. But you happen to know because you bought the file from a data broker that one of them has a pretty concerning data, pro um, sorry, health problem, or that they might be voting for a party you don't like. Who will you hire? And incredibly, you might never know that this happened. You won't have access to the kind of data that your prospective employer had on you. And even though it's illegal to discriminate, nobody can police that to that degree. So you might be a victim and you might not know. And then, of course, we can go to more and more alarming um, scenarios in which, OK, so maybe you're lucky enough to live in a democratic country. But can you be absolutely sure that your country will be as democratic in five years time, given the context and given what we've seen um, can happen that we thought wouldn't be able to happen uh, in our societies? Right. Yeah. So so any any kind of context that might make us feel relaxed now might, you know, might change at any any day. and. and that data can be used against us. Um, I want to jump straight into the main theme of your of your book, and you have some great quotations throughout. And I, I just want to uh, read some two of them, and and then you know use that as a jumping board to sort of discuss more. So your main thesis is basically privacy matters because the lack of it gives other people power over you, and then. Somewhere else, you, you have another quotation, which I really like and is quite striking, where you say Google and Facebook are not technically in the business of data, they're in the business of power. And now I think a lot of us are coming to terms with the fact or understanding more and more that these companies and these platforms are very powerful, but we don't quite understand 
the ways in which they're powerful. What does it mean to say that Google is very powerful? What does it mean for Facebook to be very powerful? And what I've seen in the past is that people go for this kind of analogy of the state. They're, they're no longer just private companies. They're as powerful as governments. Um, so I, was, I want to ask you two interrelated questions. One, you know, what kind of power does violating my, my privacy give people? What is that power and what does it look like? And also, how should we understand the power that these technologies companies have? And is the state or government analogy uh, an accurate one? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, one of the ways in which we can realize how much privacy matters is to think about it as a kind of currency for power. So one of the reasons you don't tell your employer certain things, say about your religion or your sexual preferences, is because they might use that against you. They might not like that and it might be used against you, so you keep quiet. And in the same way, if you give too much data to companies or to governments, you might give them too much power. Now, the kind of power that um, personal data con confers is a very special kind of power. It's similar to other kinds of power that we're more familiar with, like economic and political and military power, because the essence of power is that it makes other people do what they wouldn't want otherwise do themselves. And that can be soft power in terms of persuasion, or it can be harder power. There are certain things that the platforms don't allow you to do, and you are um, pushed into doing things that you wouldn't otherwise do. And the special kind of power that personal data confers is has to do with the power of influencing people, the power of both predicting their behavior, but also being able to uh, intervene in that behavior. So when I say that technically Google and, and Facebook don't are not in the business of data, I mean that technically they don't sell your data. Other companies do, but they don't sell your data because it's too, it's too um, valuable actually. They get more value out of it if they keep it than if they share it. And so what do they sell? They sell the power to access you. They sell the power to access your attention. When you go into a website, there is something going on called a real-time bidding. And what that means is that um, advertisers are fighting to get your attention. And before you even consent, before you even click on anything, your personal data has been sent to potentially hundreds of advertisers. And by personal data, I mean really sensitive things like politics and a sexual orientation and what you bought yesterday and where you live and whether you're a man or a woman, fat or slim, and um, all kinds of things. And then advertisers bid for you. And the one that bids the most, the higher price, they get the privilege of showing you their ad. And this means that, for instance, if that personal data includes things like you are thinking about leaving your partner or you are thinking about changing jobs, then the advertising for a divorce lawyer or the advertising for a particular job will be willing to pay more because they know they can influence you in this very vulnerable time in your life. And then you get to see an ad and, and you get to do things that you wouldn't otherwise do and that are not always in your best interest. So you might say, well, I actually do need a divorce lawyer. Um, but in some cases, we get ads for things that are really bad for us, like gambling. And there's a lot of evidence that, um, for, for instance, children gamble much more than they used to because they get exposed to these kinds of ads. Or you might get an ad for a really bad payday loan uh, with terrible conditions that will only land you in a more vulnerable position. And that has been targeted to you in particular because you're in a vulnerable position. Yeah, that's, I guess, the, the kind of scary part about, about this um, uh, personalization, right? That it, we're, sometimes, as you say in your book, we're being sold this as a kind of VIP treatment. It's just like, these ads are only made for you, but they're made for you not to serve your interests, but to sometimes undermine, undermine your interests and you know, serve the interests of other parties that want to sell you stuff or want to um, sell you services. Um, in terms of understanding this, this kind of slightly slippery kind of nature of power that these places have over us, you, you reach to um, Michel Foucault, who's you know, a philosopher that has written a lot about power and, is, and has tried in his writings to kind of steer us away from these kind of monolithic ways in which we think of, of power, usually through either you know, the, the government or um, through violence. Uh, and you do too, 
you, you reach for Foucault in your book and, and, and um, use his philosophy. So what does, what does he have to, to teach us about the nature that, of power and that these companies have over us? He can teach us a few things. One of the things I found more valuable is that he argues that power creates subjects. So power creates a kind of mentality around it and it creates, it has influence on how people view themselves and experience themselves and, and experience their surroundings. And a lot of the power that tech has and a lot of the ways in which it enhances that power is through narratives. So it tells stories about why data is important, why you shouldn't worry about it, why they can be trusted, why data is needed for technology when in fact it's just a business model um, data doesn't need to be sold or bought for tech to work well. And I think this idea that it's creating a certain mentality in us is very important. And in particular, when you um, join that with other researchers um, like um, Steve Lux, you, you get the picture that power not only creates these mentalities and these subjectivities, um, but it also influences all, all, all our architecture in our, in, our, in our lives, essentially. So the kind of things that you're allowed to do and not are incredibly influenced by tech and will be more so. One insight that I really like um, from uh, Jamie Suskin's book, Future Politics, is how more and more there, there are rules that instead of just being rules that you can break and then you can have a fee or you can have certain consequences or you can have different alternatives, the rules are just being coded in a way that you don't get a choice whether you want to follow the rule or not. That's just the code and there's no way to break it. And in a democratic society, that might be very concerning. One of the, one of the interesting, uh, and I'll come to the sort of potential objection about whether you know, the effectiveness of, of this sort of attempt to manipulate this. But one idea that I think comes out maybe of these sort of Foucauldian thoughts about, um, you know, different ways of creating subjects is, you know, whether, whether these places really know us very well or not, they have some image of ourselves. They have this kind of idea of who we are and they keep projecting that image back to us through our screen, through what we see through the content we're exposed to in social media or when we search items online. And I was wondering whether, you know, in some ways it doesn't matter whether their picture of us is very accurate because they ultimately managed to kind of create a new subject out of us, you know, molded in, in, you know, in the image that they have of, of who we are. Um, and I was wondering whether you, you have any thoughts about this kind of slightly different way of thinking about it. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So one of the insights of Foucault is that power creates knowledge as much as knowledge creates power. So I think the idea that if you have knowledge, you have more power is very intuitive and it's actually very old. It comes from uh, Bacon and he argues that, okay, you, you can imagine how if you know more about people, then you have more leeway to intervene, to do things. Um, and if you know more about the environment in general, any kind of knowledge gives you a certain kind of power. But the converse is also true. So power can create knowledge as much as knowledge creates power. And what Foucault means is that whoever is in power decides what knowledge is, decides what counts as knowledge. So when you know, very powerful companies like Google and Facebook brand us in a certain way as, OK, so you are a liberal uh, X years old with this kind of educational background, even if that information might be inaccurate, it doesn't matter because they decide what counts as knowledge and we get treated however they decide we are supposed to be treated, even if that information is incorrect. And in some cases it's incorrect. So Julianne Gwynn um, made this test. She bought uh, information about herself from data brokers. And if I remember correctly, I don't, I don't know if it was her or, or it was somebody else who she interviewed, but in one case, there was this woman who got branded as somebody who hadn't finished high school. And in fact, she had a PhD, but that didn't matter because these companies don't have enough of an incentive to make sure that their data is super accurate. As long as it's accurate enough to give them an advantage, they don't really care whether they get it right or not. And the ones who suffer are us because we might be treated in a way that's completely unfair um, based on inaccurate data. And furthermore, there's this kind of 
further consequence that we might get branded as something and then that creates a, an impact in our self-image in which we kind of believe the narrative that they're telling others and we kind of um, become these subjects that have been created by power. And one of Luke's insights is that sometimes power creates desires in people that go against their interests. So not only are we buying this narrative and kind of believing the image of us that they are uh, constructing, but we also start to have desires that are actually going to undermine our interests. Like, you know, we start craving for um, knowing what's the latest thing on Twitter or Facebook or whatever social media got, uh, has you hooked up and uh, it, it further enhances their power. Yeah, I think that, I mean, in some ways, the way in which they influence our behavior is is obvious to all of us, right? Because we do spend more time than we want on Twitter or on Facebook. And, you know, we, we, we do have this feeling that it's not really what we intended to do, but it's something we end up having to do. But I do want to sort of, you know, play a little bit devil's advocate and say, like, are we are we buying too much of this sort of like self-promotion that these companies offer us in terms of like their power you know we often make fun of the ads that we see online which might be you know completely stupid and unrelated to anything we might ever want to buy or then we buy something and then afterwards we keep seeing ads for the same thing we've already bought and we think really is this is this like the powerful algorithmic predictive technology behind all this you know this seems very basic and I, I was wondering whether you know there was all this controversy with Cambridge Analytica and whether you know their psychometric profiling of people through the data they had collected was any good and was it really product predicting people's voting um, intentions and I don't know if you've, you've um, heard at all about Joe Lepore's latest book um, I think it's called If Then which kind of tracks the history of a lot of these uh, technologies and, and this kind of desire to predict human behavior based on data and Part of what she exposes is that a lot of these attempts were total failures. Um, they, you know, they, they, they resembled more this kind of like Theranos, uh, more recent scandal in Silicon Valley, where you know these companies were selling something that didn't really exist. You know, it didn't really work. So, uh, what is your what is your take on that? Are we are we too vulnerable to buying the story that these companies tell about about their power? So, on the one hand, I think. It's, we're, you're right to be skeptical about it. And in many cases, it's true. Like may, maybe you would have bought those shoes anyway. And for the most part, even for the most part, that might be true. But there are kind of two concerns that, that are still relevant, even if that's true. One is that even if ads, personalized ads actually don't work, and actually, I have a whole section in the book for why I argue that it, this is not evidence-based and that personalized ads don't actually um, work as you know, Facebook and Google say they work. And actually, just buying them costs companies more than they earn extra for the personalized bit because personalized, personalized ads are much more expensive than non-personalized ads. Uh, but even if that's true, your personal data has already been sent to all these hundreds of corporations and your file has already been created and sold to other companies and, and that will have an effect in your life. So the next time you apply for a job or apply for a loan or even apply for an apartment, that file has, is having an effect on your life. So even if you're not swayed by the ads, the effect of those ads are very, very significant in what you can and can't do. Not because they influence you directly, but because there's this file that is like a zombie or like an avatar, an online avatar following you around and deciding what you can and can't do and how you're treated in the world. So that's already concerning. A second concern is that even if the effect is very, very mild, which I think evidence suggests that it is, that it, it does have an effect, but it's very, very small. When you have an audience that is so huge, when, that, when, that it covers really the whole of the world, you only need to have a very, very small effect to sway an election. Many elections are won and lost on the basis of a few thousand votes. And it is perfectly possible um, to have that kind of small effect. And when it's personalized, you can find the people in whom it will have more an effect and really target them 
So, you know, the people who are, for, for instance, extremely busy and wouldn't have remembered to vote on time unless they get a, like uh, alerts all the time, or the people who are kind of undecided, but really kind of want, want to vote, but are not sure. And then you kind of uh, tip the balance in, in one way or another. So you only need to have a very slight effect when you have a population that's so large as a whole mm. country or the whole world. Right. So even if even if we, you know, even if they're much less effective than than they say they are, that, that should still be alarming for, for those two reasons. A, our data is still out there and B, um, you know, even if it has a tiny, tiny effect that can still have large consequences. And that brings me to the kind of, uh, you know, bigger theme in some ways about privacy being a threat to liberal democracy. And that's kind of part of your argument in the book. And that might sound a little counterintuitive. You might think, well, why does, you know, why does our, why does Google selling me personalized ads have anything to do with liberal democracy? You know, doesn't misinformation, for example, play a, a bigger you know, role and as a bigger threat to um, our political system. You know, all these conspiracy theories gaining traction online. And um, so what do you say to that kind of uh, question? And is there a connection between the problem of misinformation online and the problem of privacy violation? There's definitely a connection. So at least part of the reason why fake news is uh, having such an impact and propagating is because it's based on personalized content. So it's not just that certain kind of crazy ideas are out there, it's that people are getting targeted on the basis of their psychological traits um, for those ideas in particular, and that we don't see the same thing. So you and I, we, we don't have an unmediated access to reality. We don't know what you know Trump or Boris Johnson is doing right now. We don't go and like knock at their doors and ask them, hey, what, what's going on here? We read about it through our screens. And so most of what we learn about the world is through our screens and even more in the context of the pandemic in which we're really kind of stuck in a room for, for uh, or have been for a long while. And the screens are, are the, the access to the world. And if we get an image of the world that's completely contrary, if you, know, you get uh, an image of candidate X as this wonderful person, empathic, and reasonable, and I get an image of candidate X as this total uh, psychopath, then when we come together to talk, we're not really talking about the same thing. So it, it will be very, very difficult to understand each other. And it's much more likely that we'll think that the other person is, is crazy or unreasonable or a bad person than to realize that no, actually, they're getting an image of the world that is very different from the image that you're getting. And when, when ads or other kinds of content is public, then people can talk about it. Academics and journalists and citizens can say, hey, look at what this politician did, isn't that crazy? And we can agree on the facts and then disagree about how to interpret those facts. But we, when we can't even agree on the facts because we're not seeing the same thing, then the public sphere gets fractured. So that's one way in which privacy is affecting liberal democracy. Another way is by jeopardizing equality. So you and I are not being treated as equal citizens with um, equal rights and equal right to an opportunity. You are being shown ads for, for instance, high paying jobs that I'm not being shown those ads because I'm a woman. There was a study that showed this. Um, you are being shown um, ads for all kinds of things that I'm not seeing. And also you've been treated differently. So you might you know, have a different kind of waiting list than I do you might be paying a different price for the same plane ticket that we're buying. And that kind of inequality jeopardizes democracy. What I say in the book is that privacy is the kind of blindfold that blinds the system so that citizens are treated impartially and equally and fairly. If we are treated on the basis of our data because we're fat or, or, or slim or rich or poor, then we're not being treated as equal citizens. So that's another way in which privacy affects liberal democracy. And yet another way is I'm worried about this culture of exposure in which everybody's pushed to be absolutely transparent, to say everything that's in their mind, to share what they ate, where they went on holidays. And there's a kind of aggressiveness about it that, and it makes, there, it makes people need to have much more conflict in the public sphere than would be necessary if we just held back a bit and you know, didn't say everything we thought about others and everything 
that's that's in our minds there's this kind of just because companies profit from this we are being encouraged to share everything even if it's the lowest quality thing that's going on in, in our mind and that sharing leads us to unnecessary conflict and it also distracts us from more important topics yeah and you you kind of as you since you mentioned um this kind of you know personal responsibility in some ways that we have to also like hold back a little bit and not share everything that we do all the time online um i was i really like the kind of comparison that you draw between um privacy and uh, ecological issues and you say somewhere in your book that privacy resembles ecological issues as a collective action problem so you know it's all it's it's all great if i you know end up having my privacy settings uh, on my browser and i don't use facebook all that much or i try and use uh, a vpn when i when i browse the internet but you argue in your book that actually whatever whatever i do that still might not be enough to protect my privacy why is that why is this a collective action problem yeah one of the biggest myths uh, surrounding privacy is that it's just a personal preference or an individual thing and it's just up to you whether you want to share it or not and if you want to share it then that's fine and there's no reason not to i argue that privacy is a political concern and collective for many reasons but two main ones one is that your privacy contains your sorry your data contains the data of many other people so if you share your genetic data it contains data about your parents your siblings um, your kids but also very distant kin that might have um, consequences for their life and important consequences in the same way if you share data about your location you're sharing data about your co-workers um, your neighbors if you share data about your psychological traits you're sharing data about people like you so every time you expose yourself you're really also exposing others so that's one way in which privacy is collective but another way is that we suffer the consequences collectively so in the case of Cambridge Analytica, for instance, only 270,000 people uh, consented to do the survey and to give Cambridge Analytica data. Even they, I mean, they weren't conscious of what they were doing and that they were actually consenting to a, a data firm trying to influence politics, but they gave their data away. From that data, Cambridge Analytica got to the data of 87 million friends without their knowledge or consent. And with that data, they did psychological profiling that they then applied to the citizenry of entire countries. So in a way, um, all the citizens of these countries whose democracy was being threatened got to suffer the consequences of the consent of these 270,000 people who gave their data away. So that's another way in which data is collective. And um, privacy also um, is analogous to ecological issues in the sense that it accumulates. So no, you know, if, if, you, if you pollute your river with one little piece of trash, that's not going to create climate change. And no individual car creates climate change, but it's the accumulation of these things that creates a really big problem. In the same way, no data point is going to be the problem for, you know, an authoritarian regime to abuse it or for you to get discriminated against. Um, but it's the accumulation of data points that create the picture that then gets abused. Yeah, that's that's really interesting, and it kind of brings out the idea that you know political action is essentially also necessary to tackle this problem. It can't be something that we do as individuals, just like climate change. You know, it does, it's not enough for me to do all the recycling and not to take all these flights, but you know, it has to be a kind of uh, more centrally uh, planned and tackled problem. Um, I want to squeeze in one quick more question about, you know, something you you touched upon earlier, which is why are we here? You know, why? And and I think what I liked about your book is that you highlight the kind of contingency of where we are. We didn't have to be here. It didn't these companies didn't have to um, collect our data in order to exist or in, in order to be profitable. Um, I'm particularly struck by this point that you make um, at some point about. Um, given the number of users google has it would it would only take ten dollars per user to uh, recreate it, the revenue that it has through selling our um our data and and um, to third parties and so on so could this could this be 
different? Could we be, could we still have these, you know, platforms that we like to use and these search engines that are so useful throughout our day, um, but not have, you know, the cost of, of having our data kind of exploited? Because it's often a, a story that we're told that, you know, this is, this is all part of technological progress and this has to go hand in hand uh, with, um, with all the good stuff that comes, that comes with it. Yeah, I think the narrative of technological progress is very misleading because it's technological progress at the cost of social and political regress. And it's technological progress that doesn't need this social and political regress. So as I tell the story in, in my book, there was a point when uh, Google needed funding. They were just another startup. They were being very successful in terms of what they did and how many users they had, but they couldn't uh, raise money for themselves. And they were at a really critical point in which investors were um, thinking about pulling out. And before then, people at Google didn't like ads. And in fact, uh, the founders of Google had published a paper in 1998 in which they explicitly said that any search engine that depends on ads will be vulnerable to different biases and that only an academic search that can be really impartial uh, will give users the, the best possible service. But you know, they needed money and they could have gone the other, another way, right? They could have become something like Wikipedia or a, a really kind of academic tool, but they wanted it to be a business and they didn't know how to sell it otherwise. And so they decided to um, change their loyalties and instead of users being the, their clients, advertisers became their clients. But that didn't have to be that way. It could have been otherwise. And maybe we would be in a very different world. And you know, maybe Google back then couldn't sell their, their product because we didn't know how good it might be. And we weren't willing to pay $10 for a startup who, that you know, might, might be really bad. But now we really understand the value of Google. We understand the value of Google Maps and Gmail and all of that. And I think people will be more than happy to pay uh, their way without having their um, data being compromised in this way. In the same way, um, most of the technology that works with data could work with data just the same way. They just need to not sell it and make sure that they use that data in our interest and not against us for us to have a system that respects the right to privacy, our basic rights, which, you know, it's crazy to have a business model that depends on the mass violation of rights. It's, it's insane. And just to go back to the analogy with ecology, one thing that privacy has as an advantage that ecology doesn't is that if you do everything right, if you recycle, if you don't take flight, um, it might have no advantage for yourself and you might still fry <laughs> because of climate change because nobody else did their part. But with privacy, if you do everything right, you can actually save yourself from a big, big problem. And you, you, maybe you won't know about it, but you might save yourself from discrimination, from identity theft, from public humiliation, from all kinds of things. And you know, in addition, if other people do their part as well, we can pressure um, public officials for them to regulate properly. Great, Chris. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I have more questions, but I think I should uh, pass you on to, to Anthony now, who, who will um, uh, facilitate the Q&A uh, and ask the questions from the audience. Yeah, um, I mean, um, Alexis is a master interviewer, but a novice at Zoom, so I thought <laughs> I'd offer the option to come in so he didn't have to juggle the conversation and the questions. So, yeah, I've, I've been reading them as, as they come in. So I thought I'd just start with a, a, a basic question, which is from Tonya Stevens. And she asked, where is the best place to find out how to protect personal data? My first instinct is your book, but there may be another better answer to that. So we can start with that question because it's a fundamental one that I'm sure a lot of people are asking. Yeah, so there might be uh, other guides, but I haven't found them. I tried to write the book that I wish I could have read when I started getting um, concerned about this topic. And so all of chapter six is about how to protect your privacy from cultural things like ask people before you upload uh, photographs to very uh, precise advice like, you know, we use this service instead of this other one. And you need to think about um, where you buy your, your laptop and your phone and what kind of messaging service uh, you want to use and very practical advice. 
Oh, well, I'll, I'll move on to another question, which is also from Tonya Stevens, and this is more um, a, a very current question that I think a lot of people are asking. It touches on something you and Alexis were talking about a minute ago. She asks, is the NHS COVID app invading our privacy or is it as benign as it claims? That's a very good question. So the first COVID app that didn't make it through uh, was a disaster. And it was a disaster uh, for privacy reasons and also just functionally. And that's a really interesting case to look at because then um, Google and Apple uh, basically made the NHS change the app. And that shows how much power they have. And in this instance, it looks like a good thing, right? Because our privacy is being better protected. But we don't know whether next time is going to be a bad thing. And that they have more power than our own government is a bit alarming. But OK, so the new app, it looks much, much better. It's a decentralized system, which means that your data is being kept in your phone. Um, the jury is still out because we need to test it. And sometimes problems don't come out uh, until you know a, a, few, a few weeks after the fact. But it looks much better. One thing that did concern me a bit is that uh, the, the police got told not to install it in their own phones. And so that makes you wonder whether that is a judgment of the government of their own product. Uh, but because it depends on this API that was designed by Google and Apple and it was designed for privacy and designed to be decentralized, from the point of privacy, it looks much better. Uh, now, what I worry about is that the app won't work unless we have a really robust and functional mass um, testing service. And that seems to be not working as well as it should uh, to do the best it can. But that's a different kind of concern. Cool. Um, Alexis, feel free at any point if something Chris says or one of the questions asked triggers anything just to come in. Um, there is, I mean, one of the themes that has come up is this connection between the individual and the collective. So Daniel French asks, the problem is clearly something that has to be tackled collectively, but is there any collective direct action that has already been taken? Um, and there's a related question, which is, is there any way to effectively police major companies over privacy violations? So I suppose it's about direct collective action and whether there is a precedent set or what the prospects are in that regard. Yeah, so a few things are being done. One is just every time you choose a privacy friendly service or you click no to the cookie um, um, request, you make a statement and companies are listening. You would be surprised that, you know, how worried they are about what people think and how much they're mon monitoring people's sentiment. So every time you do an action like that, it's really part of a collective action of people resisting the data economy. It also creates a data trail for regulators. So when, they, when the regulator looks at that company, if you said, no, I don't want you to collect my data, or if you sent an email asking for your data to be deleted and it wasn't, that creates evidence for them to be fined. Another thing that's being done is that there are amazing um, institutions or organizations out there like None of Your Business or Privacy International, and there are others that are bringing these tech companies um, to court. And there's a lawsuit against, but there are many lawsuits against Facebook right now, against YouTube, against Google. And every now and again, they win. And it makes a huge difference because it creates a precedent. And it's like a, a step that we climb in, in, in the right direction. And so very recently, um, I think it was Facebook that lost a lawsuit. And now they have to pay $400 to people in Illinois because they use facial recognition on them. And this is hugely important. So you, you know, it, it's a really not good idea to follow these lawsuits because um, they really give you a, a, um, a reason for optimism. One of the thing that Carissa's answer triggered uh, in me is this great bit in the book where you talk about the Orwellian kind of language that these companies use. You mentioned cookies, uh, you know, and so every time, you know, a website tells you, well, we use cookies, are you okay with that? What you should be reading according to Carissa is like, we're using spyware, are you okay with that? You know, so this kind of euphemistic language is part of the way in which, you know, the power dynamics are kind of disguised and seem a lot more innocent than, than they really are. Yeah, that's true. They're totally colonizing um, language. So if you think about Apple, cloud, streaming, tweets, they're using all these words to describe very uh, pleasant, natural things. And, and yet they, they are doing something completely 
um, against that kind of um, reference. Great. So I just want to thank um, Hira Hussein, who, if you look in the chat thing, she's answered a couple of things, I think, related to Tonya's question, um, a site to do with um, data stalking or another organization that works on digital rights. So that's in the chat function. So this question is just coming up, coming from Steve Thomas. I think it's kind of a good question for someone like me who literally doesn't understand like very well exactly what is going on in the process, he asks. Um, may I ask what is the key defining thing that a person is in data? Is it a name? Is it an email address? Is it legal data you can see in a credit check? And how can they then know it's you if you change computers or email address or clear your cookies? So that's very much working at the kind of level of complete confusion that I operate at in this domain. So that's a great question. What's important about your data depends on who's looking at it. So suppose it's just your insurance company. So they will want to know um, if it's your car insurance, what car do you have? What purchasing power do you have? Whether you, um, you drive very fast or not, how much do you drink? Those kinds of things. If it's your health insurance, they will look at like what you eat, whether you exercise um, and all kinds of things that are relevant to that. So it changes, depends on who's looking at your data. How do they know it's you? That's a really good question. It turns out that even though many times you, you get this message that you know data is going to be anonymized so you shouldn't worry, it's incredibly easy to re-identify data. Because for instance, take location data, your phone, okay? You have your phone on you all the time. There's only one person who sleeps where you do and works where you do. That you, you know, your phone is eight hours at night in your home and then it's eight hours at work in your work and nobody else works and lives where you do. So it's really easy to identify you. In the same way with purchasing um, data, it only takes about four data points to re-identify someone, to know who someone is because you have very particular patterns. And the ways to re-identify you are so many from facial recognition to just the way that your battery drains on your phone, because only your phone is that brand with those kind of apps and you use it for such amount of time usually. So it's really easy to re-identify someone. Another um, way that is really creepy is through audio beacons. So when you go into a store, say you go into a store to buy something and there is background music or ads and that background music has audio beacons that are being broadcasted and that you can't hear, but that your phone picks up and identifies you as the same person. So a company wants to know that if you saw an ad in, your, in the morning on your laptop, and then you like that product and you went to the store in your neighborhood, that that's you and that ad, that ad works. And the way to identify you is through these audio beacons that your phone pick, picks up or through your Wi-Fi networks and your Bluetooth networks is, is very creepy. Okay, so, so this is a um, more technical question. This is obviously someone who knows a little bit more about this field. So it's from Jeremy Crampton. He asks, I would love to hear Carissa's take on locational privacy and whether or not this is the most intimate type of data, e.g. Google's sensor vault connect, collects your location history and provides a kind of time machine of your life. Is location the next front in the privacy wars? So yes. I don't know what he's talking about, but I'm sure you do. <laughs> Location data is very concerning because it is incredibly sensitive and it doesn't seem like it. And it's something that um, governments are very interested in, but also companies. And for instance, recently there was a news um, report about how in the US it's illegal now to use this kind of data from phones for, for certain kinds of purposes. So the government can't do it they can't collect this kind of data and they can't um, um, just, just do it themselves. But they figured that they can buy this data from data brokers. And because it's for sale for anyone, that's legal. So it essentially they're bypassing a ruling from the Supreme Court because this data is commercialized and sold. So why is location data so sensitive? Well, it gives you the information of where someone lives, um, how fast they drive, where they work, who they hang out with because our phones are together when we hang out together um, you can infer things like whether somebody is sick because you go to the hospital very often whether you got an abortion because you went to the, to a clinic after you know talking for a long time with your sister about it because you were worried um, whether you, you use drugs 
it, you can infer all kinds of very, very sensitive issues, whether you're religious, whether you went to the mosque or the church, um, whether you talked with a, with a journalist because both people were carrying their phones. So it's really incredibly sensitive and it's one of the things that we should regulate as soon as possible. Okay, so um, this is a question from Adrian Hunt and he's asking like, to what extent is it the case that you could be penalized for trying to, for example, um, get rid of your smartphone? Like obviously that's one way to reduce the data risk. On the other hand, are there, I mean, the question asks are there risks related to things like your credit rating, health um, implications, insurance, all of these kind of things that are so intimately connected with smartphones that if you decided to kind of go Luddite and get rid of these things that are the large generators of data, will that have implications for your social well-being, for example, or potentially could that be the case in time? That is a really good question. It could potentially be the case in the future. In the present, my guess would be that's not the case, that whenever there is no data, um, it doesn't hurt. Like you're, you're more likely to get hurt when there's data that, that uh, speaks against you than when there's no data because not enough of the world has been digitalized to that extent. But one of the problems is that these systems and these scoring systems are so opaque that we don't know. We don't know what criteria they use. So I couldn't say for sure, I couldn't guarantee you for sure. But mm. my guess is that um, you're more likely to get hurt by too much data than by too little. Okay, and this is a question from Joanna Siafone, um, who's in the room with me, she's just sat over there. Um, she asks, how does lack of data privacy promote existing inequalities by race, gender, disability, etc.? So you were talking earlier about some of the ways in which inequalities operated. So I guess she was wanting to pick up on some more specific ways in which that could play out within those demographics. There are many ways. One way is, for instance, uh, algorithms sometimes use as proxies your postal code or even your um, laptop makeup to give you different pricing. So if you have a Mac versus uh, a, a Microsoft uh, computer, you might pay different prices. Or if you live in, in, in one um, part of the city versus another. Another way in which it creates inequalities is because typically surveillance is not um, even though everybody's surveilled to a certain extent, people who are disadvantaged are surveilled more. One of the concerning things we're seeing recently is that many um, welfare programs or government benefits are being attached to surveillance. So that if you, if you need you know, government help for one thing or another, the price to pay is, is more surveillance on you. And um, that's the tendency. Now we see people and systems fighting back. So recently there was a ruling in the Netherlands that determined that it was illegal to do this, to, to ask for more data from disadvantaged people in, in exchange for, for benefits. And I, I hope that, that, you know, that other countries will learn from the Dutch example. But for instance, in the United States, if you are someone who needs a job or if you're someone who has had some interaction with social work, um, because of family problems uh, and so on, you will be subjected to so much more surveillance than other people. And that not only creates a kind of humiliation and you know, a kind of distrust in the system, but it also gives other institutions more data on you that is very often used to discriminate against you. Okay, so I think I'll ask one more. Um, well, Michael Babbage has just come in with a question, which is privacy infringement may be a threat to liberal democracy, but can it be an aid to identity politics? It could be in theory, but we, we would need to have many more um, like um, cautions in, in place for it to work that way. So you could imagine that, you know, we need data and statistics to figure out that women are getting less opportunities or that uh, people from a certain kind of background or, or, or a minority are getting less opportunities and that that data should count for them and not against them. But for that to happen, we need to have fiduciary duties and fiduciary duties are duties that are implemented when there's an asymmetry of power and potential conflicts of interest. And the fiduciary duty establishes that the 
the benefits of the data subject should come first. So whenever, you know, when you go to your, your doctor, the doctor has a fiduciary duty towards you to only do what will benefit you. And if they have an interest in testing out a medicine because they want research on it or in uh, practicing their skills so they, they want to perform surgery on you, uh, they can't do that unless you actually really need it. And in the same way, uh, we need to make sure that whatever data is used is used for us and not, not against us. Okay, cool. And then I'll ask one question, which I guess probably will have a swift answer, and then I'll hand it back to Alexis for uh, any final comments or, or questions. So Alan Clark asks, you mentioned earlier that police personnel were told not to install the NHS app. Why, why was this? What was the reasoning behind that? It was unclear. Um, according to a BBC report, the original source said that the police had been told not to install it because of security reasons. And then the police department um, denied that and said that, no, no, um, we just wanted to make sure that people had it in their personal phones and, and, and they gave a, a kind, of, um, kind of bland explanation and they denied that it was for security reasons. So it, it's unclear. It just kind of raised doubts in some people's minds. Okay, so Alexis, any final words or questions for um, Carissa? Um, I mean, I have one one kind of quite big question, which is why have you know liberal democracies been so bad at regulating these companies when the issues that you talk about in your book, in theory, are very close to the heart of of liberal democracy? Right here, we're talking about the autonomy of the individual, uh, which is you know supposedly at the heart of our individualistic Western liberal democracies, especially in the US. And also, you know, we, we tend to have a skepticism towards concentrated power. And again, that runs through the way people think about government in, in the US. Um, and, you know, if, if, if it was hammered in people's minds that, you know, the government was collecting all this data about them throughout the day, I think people would be a lot more freaked out um, than they are thinking, oh, it's just Google, you know, they just use it for whatever. So what do you think, why do you think our, our kind of political system, even though it's kind of tailored towards these concerns, um, has so far at least kind of failed to, to tackle them? Really great question. For people who would, you know, freak out if the government were collecting this data, but not companies, you know, they should know that all data that ends up with companies, you know, can be accessed by the government one way or another and often is. And I give a lot of examples of that in the book. Uh, the surveillance society is really, from the very start, a covenant between public and, and private institutions. Why have we been so bad at it? A, a few reasons. One is that it's very profitable. People, a lot of people are making a lot of money out of this and they have an interest in this system um, going on. Another is that it really took us by surprise. I think a lot of people didn't see it coming. We didn't realize how much personal data was a kind of power because before this, we didn't have the technology to really harness that power. So I think a lot of people didn't imagine that Google would become the incredible giant that, that it became and the same with, with Facebook and, and others. We had a kind of litmus test for some, whether something was a monopoly that was based on price. And you know, here these companies are supposedly giving somewhere something free. So it just like it, it wasn't on the radar as much as it should have been if we had a different definition of what, um, what counts as a monopoly. It was too tied to price when in fact it should be tied to power, to the possibility of changing conditions and putting quite exploitative conditions and not, not losing clients or, or users. So that's another reason. A third reason was because security agencies realized they could make a copy of the data and use it for security purposes. So after 9-11, um, understandably, we had a huge trauma and intelligence agencies were trying to figure out how to make sure that this never happens. Now, it turns out that um, all evidence we have suggests that this kind of bulk data collection is not effective in preventing terrorism. And now I think governments are realizing that collecting all this data is in fact a national security threat, that we only need to hack about 10% of our appliances to bring that down the national grid of a country. And that creates a huge threat. So now I think we, we, it was an impulsive kind of decision that then kind of snowballed into this huge system. And now we're realizing this is a bad idea. It's, it's too dangerous. And I hope we can backtrack as soon as possible. 
Okay, That's so great. I think um, we're probably going to have to end there because it's eight o'clock now. So um, while you guys were in conversation, I went to buy the book on Hive and it was sold out. And then I went on to Blackwell's and it was also sold out. So I eventually got a couple of copies on foils. So if anyone's I'm sure Amazon's got it as well, but it's just obviously people are buying the book, which is great. And I'm not surprised given how beautifully you've presented your ideas. And thanks so much to you, Alexis, for the excellent questions. It's been a really great conversation. Um, the, the cafe culture season runs on the first and third Tuesdays of each month. So in two weeks time, 7 p.m. UK time, we have an event called Science Fictions, Exposing Fraud, Bias, Negligence and Hype in Science. And that's a conversation between the psychologist Stuart Ritchie, who is the author of the book of the name of the title, and the philosopher Oliver Trowley. So that should be um, a very interesting event on a sciencey front while well, tonight was politics. So um, thanks again to you both. And um, thanks to everyone who um, tuned in. There was a lot of action on the chat um, function compared with a lot of events. I'm sure Carissa will be interested to look through and maybe she can add a couple of things to that. And anyway, her book is called, um, oh God, I've forgotten it. Privacy, Privacy is Power. power. <laughs> Privacy is Power and it's out now. And um, I hope that this event will inspire you to buy it or at the very least to take a little bit more um, time and concern over the consequences of pressing yes whenever you get a cookies thing up. Okay, thanks both very much and good night or good afternoon. <laughs>